Imagine, if you can, that for three of your 14 or 15 years on life, you have been on the move in your homeland, staying one step ahead of the guns, the bullets and the bombs that are devastating you, your family, and your community. You and 16 of your family squeeze into a car so that your grandmother, your uncle, your mother, and your father, along with your siblings and your cousins, can wake up one more day. Finally, you arrive at what you hope will be a safe house. You're there for a matter of hours and your father says, we have to move. By now, his sense of survival is so finely tuned that he is aware of pending danger. You're exhausted. You were hoping for at least one good night of sleep, but your father insists, everyone get back in the car. You do as you're told. All 17 of you drive through the night hoping to get to the Jordanian border, a border that is officially closed to refugees. Your father and uncle pay a guy with no name, a guy you don't know who says he can get all of you to the border, but only in the dead of night. As you walk through harsh terrain with no light, no water, and no options, you learn the house that you had hoped to be sleeping in last night was bombed and destroyed. The house had been targeted because you and your family were there. The nightmare continues as you enter Jordan and are accepted into a refugee camp. The water is putrid. The air is thick with aromas that make you gag. And through all of it, you hope that one day you will escape the nightmare of your life. You pray for a miracle. We invited Noor Suleiman to join us for a conversation that matters about the journey she and her family endured and the blessed miracle of Canada's welcome. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Noor, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Thanks, Stu. And also, congratulations on becoming a Canadian citizen. Thank you. <laughs> it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? A very long one. Where did it start? It starts from Syria. You're from yeah. Syria? Yes. What part of Syria are you from? Dara. And where is that in, you know, most people, I think, who live here don't have a real sense of mm -hmm. the, the geography of Syria. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, on the western... Uh, Mm -hmm. side, it, you border onto the Mediterranean, yes. right, with mm -hmm. Turkey to the north and Lebanon to the south. South, yeah. And, and, and Damascus is down close to the border, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So where were, where were you from within Syria? So Dara is next to the border with Jordan. Yes. So I think that would be like the east. S side of the country, yes. Yes. But it's really kind of, so if this is Damascus, if that's Damascus, then there is right there. Oh, so okay. it's kind of below. So it was pretty close. Yeah. But your family had to leave. What, what, what happened? Uh, and give me a little bit of a time frame. Mm -hmm. In what year did all of a sudden life start to change? Because I know that when you were born, mm -hmm. life was probably pretty good, almost idyllic. <laughs> yeah, it was just pretty, everything was normal. Just like any other child, I was living my childhood and living my life and enjoying it until I think it's, for me it was 2013. This is where it's no more that beautiful life. It's that time where you have to leave. So what happened? Like in your city, yeah. I, I understand all the geopolitical, uh, the internal uh, conflict and so on that led to yeah. uh, ongoing uh, disruption, civil war, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on. But, but what were the experiences that then started to happen for you in your life that affected you and your family? It's safety. Safety is no longer was there. I think that's the main one. I mean, there were other problems for sure. Like a lot of times we had to leave our home. Like even within three years, we left our home. We went to, we lived a month for with my grandparents. And then another month we lived it, I think like my cousin, like in my relative. So like 
there was a lot of movements there. Like we'd be moving from one place to another. So, but you know, all of that was not a big deal. The biggest one was your safety. Mm -hmm. You leave your home, you have no idea if you're gonna come back or not. And for parents to see that and see their kids, how they are scared to see how, see the fear in their eyes. I think that's the time where my parents said, we can't handle this anymore. It's time to leave. We did our best to stay in our home, to stay in our country. We moved a lot, we gave a lot of sacrifices, but we can't give our kids as a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We have to leave. And 2013, this was the end point and where everything just switches and they had to leave. So what was going on? Like, were there invasion by troops? Was there bombing from the air? Uh, what was that like? All of them. All of that was present. The bombing, the invasion, everything you could imagine was actually there. I think the, the biggest one, so where I was born initially, like the village that I was lived in, it was already being taken by some people and we had to leave. So that village, that village was already gone for us. So we had to move to other village and live there. But then within that village, one day they just start bombing. Like you were sitting there and then you, suddenly all the bombs were just coming around you. And I remember it was, it was my family, my cousin family. I think my two of my cousin's family. So we're three families within that home. And then the bombing was all around us and we all were just looking around us. We were just bombing each other because we all were scared. We just want to find a safe place, but there was none of that. Mm. And like there, there's nothing, just because like the house is open, everything around is a garden, like the palms are falling around us. You have nowhere to scare. Like you have no way and nowhere to find somewhere to hide. So it's safe for you. I remember my dad was saying, leave the home, let's just go to the garden. Because if the, if the bomb comes, most likely you are gonna die because the roof is gonna fall on you. But if you are in the ground, it, it's less dangerous. I know we developed so many skills of how to find our safety within that horrible conditions. Anyway, and then with all that bombing, my dad said, that's it. We, I'm getting all of you out from here right now. And then we all got into our car and then my dad drove us out of that village. Even that's dangerous. That dangerous, but staying there and then waiting for the bomb to just fall in our home and die, that was even more dangerous. So my parents had to make the choice. Are we gonna stay here, wait for the bomb to come or are we gonna leave and try? And just try for, look for somewhere where it's safe. Just so you, you, you all pile into your dad's car. What kind of car was it? Do you uh, know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just like that open car, you know, like the one that has a big box. Okay. Yeah, so we all kind of jump there. How many people into the car? Oh, <laughs> so many. Like my family is six people. The other one is five, the other one is six. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're almost 18, 17 people in the car. Yes. And you're driving, but you don't even know whether or not the direction that you're driving in is going to be safe. We know out of that village was safe. Anywhere we were out of that village was safe. So the goal was to get out of that village and, to, to the next one. Next uh, one was safe. So what can you take with you when you've got 17 people in the car? What do Nothing. you take with you? You take your body, your soil, and then you leave. And that's it? That's it. Wow. Yeah. And, and, so, and when you arrive at the next village, what's awaiting you there? You arrive there and then you try to find if there's any empty houses that you can settle in until everything kind of calm down and then you can you figure out, oh, I'm go I gonna stay here or is it safe to go back to that village? And the houses would be empty because other people have fled? Yes, most likely, yes. So the village that you go to has been bombed out before yes. or raided. Yes. And sometimes it's by the government and sometimes it's by other forces that might be fighting against the government. That's the thing, you, you know, like you're getting, you're, you know that you're being bombed, but you don't know from where or who is responsible for it. So it might be the government, it might be some other people, it might be other country even, but you don't know. How old are you at this time? At that time, I was in a grade eight. So that would make you what, 12, 13 years yes. of age? 
and your whole life is turned upside down. Yeah. Do you start to think that you're never going to be able to get free from this? From the trauma that I lived in? Yeah. Through, yeah. I mean, it took, it, it's a lot for a kid to see. It's a lot, especially that I was the older kid. So I always had to think about my siblings because they, all of them were younger than me. So having that responsibility, having that fear and to have go through all of this, yeah. Wow, how, and how many are there uh, of you? How many siblings do you have? I have two brothers and one sister. So there's four of you that are the children and your parents. Yes. What kind of work was your father doing? He had his own business. Like he, um, he was kind of the manager of the Pepsi and Coca-Cola, kind of these big companies. So he was responsible and there are two kind of separate and kind of, you know, drive these juices, make sure that each kind of company, each store has whatever they want. So that was his business. So he lost his business. For sure. Your house is gone, all, everything that you own, and you're not sure whether or not you're gonna survive through to the next day. No. How, for how long did this uh, a nightmare uh, go on um, before you were able to find a safe place to get to, to be able to find a way out of the country? You can't really give a specific like day because, you know, for example, in my village, even within my my village, I was traveling around. Like I was moving from my house to another, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then even with these houses, one day it will be beautiful, just like before. The next day you will be woke up and then you see bombing, people screaming, people yelling because they are scared. So you never like had that time you say, okay, now I'm safe. The only day that said, okay, we are safe, it's the day when we decided to leave Syria. And where did you go? Jordan. And, and once you're in Jordan, because Jordan wasn't actively accepting refugees, was it? No. They drove us somewhere, and then I remember we had to walk for almost two hours. It was midnight, and it's all mountains, and you have no idea where you are going. You have to walk two hours until you get to a checkpoint where you find, um, I think, the Jordanian army or some people from the UN. This is where they will collect your IDs and then name you as a refugee. You get dropped off by somebody. You probably had to buy, you had to buy that service. For sure, for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you have to ask how many people were there. How many? It was even smaller car than my dad, the one that my dad owned. And I remember there were probably 30, 35, up to 40 people. How do you get that many people in a car? Just Squeeze like in. Yes. And there's kids in there. You know, like there's kids and it's, you are in the middle of nowhere, you can't see anything, it's all dark. And you have to keep the kids silent so no one can hear them. And then you, you don't get us killed. Yeah. So despite that you are leaving your home and you don't know where, where, where you are going, what you are going to find, mm -hmm. there's also kids in that car and they have to ask you to keep all the remain silent and quiet so we can cross the border and then you enter safe. And then you walk. And then my dad, my uncle, they ended up carrying my grandma. They carried your grandmother? Yes, they ended up carrying my grandma. In the dark? In the dark. And it's, you know, there's a lot of frogs, it's mountain, like it's not even easy to walk in there. Even in the daytime? Not even in the daytime. It, it, because, you know, usually the people don't walk there. You know, it's not Stanley Park where you go and you walk and you have that view. It's, this is a border where it's meant to be difficult for people to go through. But then we were forced to go through it. So you, you, you're on this trek, you wind up at a UN checkpoint. And then you then get accepted into the refugee camp? Yeah. Kinda? <laughs> yeah. It just, I remember. I'm I mean, trying to imagine this because it is so far removed from anything that I uh, have any experience with. And I can't imagine it's, uh, how horrible it must have been. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Just to go through it. I remember like the mess. I remember them. They have like that caravana, you know, like usually the one you take when you go camping, but they have that one. And then they were having people there as they were 
not human. Like they don't even treat you as a human. They, you know, like how they take all of these people and then give us all your IDs, all your Syrian IDs. They so you have nothing at this point. Yeah, they just take everything. <laughs> so they take everything and then they give you a status of refugee. So you wind up in an internment camp. What was that like? Because, you know, we hear about this, but I have no idea what it's like. It's horrible. There's so many people there. It, it, it's, you can't even live there. It's not a place to live in. It, I don't know how even they made it a checkpoint there. People there, they have to wait until, I don't know, they have the cars comes or they have enough people. I don't really know what their strategy was at that time. But I remember we wait until the morning and then there were like big buses they come and then they take us to the Zatari like this is where kind of the official one where people stay but even that one it was in horrible condition like I remember when we got there my parents were shocked they, they, like they never imagined that it would be that bad you don't have clean water to drink I remember like I wanted I was so thirsty but the water I could see there is green stuff in it and then my dad was saying, don't drink any of that. I'm just like, but I'm thirsty. I said, like, no, don't. Because, because it'll make you sick. Yeah, because it, you can't see it, you know? It's not like, oh, you know, it's dirty, but, like, it's clear. But, like, no, you actually can see there is, there is bacteria, there is stuff in there that you, you can't drink it. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. How long were you in the internment camp? We left so quickly. My parents said, I... I I, sk I skipped from the war not to put you in this camp and die because of viruses or die because of illnesses, because of unhealthy conditions. He said, no. So where did you go from there? I had already an uncle who lived in Jordan. We called him. We told him that this place, we can't stay in here for even a minute. We have to get out of here. Yeah. He brought a car, a truck or something. First, we have to wait until we did our paper. Like, I think we stayed there five to six hours. We did our papers, we did check, the, check in, and everything is there. And so then you were able to at least be in, in a safe place. Yes. How, what was the process from there getting to Canada? From Jordan to Canada? Yeah. It was unexpected. It was. Yeah, yeah because we did hear that there is kind of chances of people applying for to the UN to get kind of travel to out countries, but my parents never thought about it because they thought, oh, it's just maybe false news, nothing of this is true. Mm -hmm. And and I knew when there was one of my cousins, she was so obsessed with it. She was always kind of looking and reading articles, trying to find a way. But my parents were saying, no, probably it's all lies. None of this is true. No one is going to take us out of here. And but then we got a phone call and then they were saying, do you want to come to Canada? You have been elected to come to Canada. How important it, has it been to you and your family that Canada has said, come, uh, come and join us? My parents did not believe it at the beginning. Like when my dad came in and then he was saying this, we all looked at him just like, no, you're kidding. None of this is true. He said, no, look, at this is the phone number. This is a strange phone number. I swear, this is what they told me. And they said, you have an interview. Do you want to come? We could not believe that. Is it really happening? Like, there have been a lot of people trying to sign up. There is, you know, like the, my cousin was there. She was like, you can't get that phone call. I was trying so hard. I did not get it. How did you get that? That's why we, it was unbelievable that, oh, actually, Ken is offering this. And what was it like when you first arrived here? What was that? If I'm going to compare it back to Jordan, like, here you take an airplane to get you to Toronto. You got to the airport, everything is clean. Everyone is welcoming you. And then they were taking care of you because, oh, you have been in a flight for 20 hours. You should be sick. They were with like health checks. They look at your feet, like they see, do you have fever? How was your ears? Like your ears, do you have any problem with them? Like, a lot of care was given there. And just looking at that, I'm just like, wow, how different is it <laughs> from walking in a rock and you have no idea where you are going and you're only carrying one change of clothes there and to a place where you actually have your backpacks. You actually pack up your clothes to, and you take an airplane and there's actually people here welcoming you and saying, welcome to Canada. Just imagine that. 
That's unbelievable. That's so beautiful. And you've gone to school. Yes. And you've become part of the BD Luminaries program because you were uh, recognized for having extraordinary uh, drive, determination, academic credentials, and you're on to university now. What are you studying? Health science. Health science. Yeah. Can you <laughs> <laughs> it seems remarkable, doesn't it? Yeah. How important is Canada to you now and to your family? I think the biggest thing that there is safety for sure, like what Canada has provided, but the second thing is education. If I look back to Jordan, I remember I was crying when I was in grade 11 because universities were so expensive that no way my dad would be able to afford money. I remember even one of my siblings, he was saying, I'm gonna leave school, I'm gonna work, and then we are gonna pay for your education. So one of my brother actually said, I'm gonna sacrifice my future so you can go to university. Hmm. Can you imagine just like the whole family has to work in order for one person in that family to go to college? Mm -hmm. And then look here, everyone of us in college. Yeah. It's open. You work hard, this is your reward. You go to college. There, even if you work so hard. I remember there was also an A student. There's no reward. Mm -hmm. Simply, I was a Syrian refugee. But here, you're in Canada. No one look, oh, are you a refugee? Oh, are you immigrant? Oh, wait, are you from Syria? None of this matters. Now you're a Canadian. Yes, now I'm a Canadian. Isn't it fabulous? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's a long journey, but when I look at him, just like, wow, oh, so many things. And just like you can't keep track of them. There is so many things that happen in a very short time. Well, maybe now they feel short time, but back then they were feeling as if they are forever, but yeah. And going forward, you're going to be an amazing contributor to this great country that we call Canada. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me here. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to share this story.